discussion. Who didn't come? Everyone that didn't come? Yeah. What did you guys understand from that? 
besides that David cannot read. Basically, yes, uh, Jesus sent the twelve disciples to go and to Israel and you know, tell them about his coming. Basically, right? So that's that's what it is. Christ is talking to the twelve, and he's giving them, he's sending them out to the world, and he's giving them instructions. Why I wanted you guys to go home and read it is so you can kind of think about what the verses are saying. And then when you come here, you get the, like a little bit more enlightenment as to how deep the verses are. And you don't get appreciated if you're not at home reading it first. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you guys are just coming here and like learning, you're like, oh, okay. But like when you read it by yourself, the whole point of it is to, for you to understand how much of a difference there is when we're reading it on our own. And then in light of everything that our fathers have taught us when we read it again and how deep the Bible is. But you won't appreciate that until you go home and you're just reading it. Because there's a lot of verses that you're going to overlook and not even think about, right? So now let's look at what our fathers put in place for us to help us understand. It says, Jesus called his 12 disciples. Jesus called his 12 disciples. So here's what's happening. There's the 12 disciples. Who's calling them? Who's calling them? Jesus is calling the 12 disciples. Notice, it's not like, come here and sign up for the 12 disciples. It's not a try, a try out like, you know, like everybody come here and then you get to try out to be my disciple. It's not like anybody who comes will, will, will be my disciple. But Jesus is the one who's going to the disciples and he's selecting 12 to be part of them. First of all, there's 120 family of what's known as the family of Christ. There's the 12 disciples, the 72 uh, out of eight, which are like the, the the second level of disciples, if you guys will. And then there's the 36 uh, female women who are part of like the family of Christ. Do you guys know about this? Do you guys know about this? The 120 family, right? Yes, no, maybe, perhaps. So this is what, when we talk about the family of Christ, there's 120 of them. The 12 disciples, the 72 uh, odd beat or like students, I guess. Um, but they were... They weren't young or anything like that. And then there's the 36 uh, women who are also serving. So there's 120 families. The 12 of the apostles. Are you guys with me? Mm -hmm. The 12 are the apostles. They're like, later on they played the, the position of what we would call today a bishop. Uh, well, even then they were a bishop. Um, and and uh, so he's the one who went out and called them to be his disciple. So what we learn from this is... There are certain, like, all of us are meant to serve. You guys agree with that, right? Yes. But not all of us are called to serve for the same position. So God is the one who calls us for a particular position. It's important to understand that. Because sometimes, especially when we come to the church, we try to, like, choose in what area we're going to serve in. Are you guys with me? Are you guys with me? Yes. And we want to, like, dictate in which direction we're going to serve. In. That's not correct. What we should do is, we should prepare ourselves. Please come in. Please, please, please. Grab a chair, though. The only reason why I was nice is because I thought of somebody else. <laughs> Understand when we come into the church that we can't choose which like like which type of service we're gonna serve. This is a big big problem, especially particularly in a, a a service where we stand in front of the public. Are you guys with me? Are you guys listening? Or I feel like people are distracted. Okay. So particularly in areas where we're serving in front of public, um, there's an inner like self of us that want to be seen in front of people. You know what I mean? So like we want to be like competing, especially and, and and this is true when it whenever it comes time to like leading a group discussion or something like that. If you guys ever noticed, and YOTC I'm talking about, right? There comes a time where maybe some people are just not like that's not their gift is to lead a discussion, but they come really prepared and they come like they put in a lot of time, but it's just not their gift. 
So instead of like saying, maybe I should let this pass, people just want to be in the spotlight. So like me, 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 me. You ever seen that before? Like me, me. Like kids do it all the time. But sometimes, sometimes that like feeling never goes away even when we're old. And this comes out in a, in a, in a public in a public setting, whenever we're ready to serve in a public, like teachers, teachers, teachers. This is something that really like gets to them. For example, if you're teaching one class, and then somebody else who may be younger or whatever starts teaching and, and dominates your class, you might feel some type of way about it. Like, I'm supposed to be, why is he teaching my class, right? Or if you're a mazamra, you know, like, everybody knows I got a very beautiful voice. So, please, please, please. Please, please. <laughs> so, whenever, like, if somebody else is the one who's who's doing doing the Muslim all the time, that shouldn't like get to your mind and say, like, no, like, why not me? You know, this feeling, or even in a leadership position for like for a president or whatever, like to lead YOTC or to be a leader of any spiritual, especially spiritual groups. This is not a competition. It's not about being seen. It's when God chooses you. And you know you have failed whenever you start saying, let it be me. See, God's calling is, you don't say anything and, and, and God will choose you. Until then, just be ready. That's your job. Be ready for any position within the church and say, like, I'll accept. I'm me, right? But then if you're not chosen for that particular position, you should understand that it's not your call. Don't say, like, me. Me, I want to do this, I want to be the president, I want to be the leader, whatever. God is the one who chooses you. He chose and called the 12 disciples. This is very, very important. Because, uh, it's especially, again, the more you serve, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And people who have served longer may understand what I'm saying. If you're new, maybe not. Um, everyone is called to serve, but not everyone is called, especially, like, for example, priesthood, um, guys, right? Like, not everybody is called into priesthood, and that's okay, and that's your in the blank. Uh, called to be a uh, priest. So, there needs to be that level of humility. Prepare yourself and say, okay, if the calling comes, but don't try to push it without the calling being there and saying, no, I'm going to do it this way. We're all meant to serve, but not all of us are meant to be serving the exact same way. This is not a competition. Not everybody is called to be a priesthood. That's your covenant blank. Keep going. Mm -hmm. We need to figure out what service call, uh, Christ has called us for. Um, this is also important. So when I say that we're not called for the same service, I don't mean like sit back and don't do anything. Figure out what your talent is. Because God has given you a talent, right? And you're supposed to be using that talent. And you're supposed to be working on that. Mind you, the talent that you're given, you're not going to be perfect at it the first time you do it. Are you guys with me? Yes. Is everybody paying attention? So the first time you're given, a, a, like, for example, a task to do, you may feel overwhelmed. Like, that, may, that might seem like it's too much. Like, a lot of people say, I know nothing about this, you know? I don't know anybody who says, uh, like, oh, I know a lot. Well, I do, but <laughs> chances are, and they know this. Like, when I chose him to start teaching, or when God chose him, the first thing you said is, it's not for me, right? The first thing you said is, leave me alone, right? And now, here we got two teachers, and, and, and the same thing. So, whenever, like, when you might feel overwhelmed, you're like, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what took you so long? <laughs> no, but, uh, so, so what we have to understand is you have to, like, the first time when you do anything, yeah, it's going to seem over, like, you know, it's going to seem hard, right? But you got to push through and understand that there is a gift for you. Sometimes it's really not meant for you. There are certain things that's not meant for you, you, you got to come to terms with. But other things you will never know until you kind of push through and, and find your niche or whatever and then start doing it. Like the discussion groups, we, we, had, we had a very long, you guys felt like that wasn't a plate. And now look how it's going, right? So sometimes you got to push through in order to find your talent. So by no means am I saying don't find your talent because everybody is given a talent. You are created for a reason. We're taking that away from whenever we say I'm good at nothing, we're taking something away from God. Uh, one, one priest once said, uh, and there's two people I can't stand, he said. People who say I know it all and people who say I know nothing. Because both are impossible. It's impossible for you to know everything and it's impossible for you to know nothing. Clearly you know something. 
right? So whenever in service and in church, like, don't say, oh, I'm, I'm not good at anything. No, you're good at something. Find out what it is. Work on it. But at the same time, being humble enough to say, like, I can't do everything either. So whenever God calls you for a particular, you know, position, get ready, get prepared, but also get ready to back down and say, okay, maybe this wasn't for, meant for me. If you weren't called for it. If you weren't called for it. Um, okay. And then once they were called, as, as you guys will see, and if you guys read more, the disciples are making like a lifetime commitment with Christ. This isn't a weekend job. This isn't like an after school activity. This isn't a school club. This is a lifetime commitment being a disciple of Christ, right? Right? Yeah. So when we are a disciple of Christ, we're literally giving everything up for Christ. This is running in the family. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. 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 You passed it down. Yeah, I know what we have. Oh, wow. Mm. So we got to struggle for like five years. <laughs> 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 I don't care. <laughs> So here's the thing, um, if you guys see, if you guys see, uh, a lot of times within the Bible study, it's, a, it's, it's young folks that come. Why? Because when people get old, there are two things that happen. One, truly they're busy. Truly, like, you know, you get married, you have kids and stuff, and you're busy. The second thing is, Bible study is seen as like a childish thing. Like, now we moved on to something bigger. I, I, I will never forget this. When we were young, uh, like back back in the day, like we were this, this tall. Um, I remember like tablets, tablets was coming out, you know, and tablets like we usually go and you say, I'll tell myself, my friends like, let's go tablet. You know, that's what we used to say. <laughs> are, you, are you for me? Are you tablet? You know? <laughs> so, so, yeah, you know, and then we were like, come on, let's go. And they were like, nah, man, like, come on, like, you know, like, come on, man. And then it was like, they were too cool for it. You know, like suddenly they were, they were too grown. You know, like even when you pray. You know, at I, I, a certain age, like when you're like a teenager, so, like you gotta be cool, so you can't like mazamba like. <laughs> you know, you gotta be like. <laughs> you gotta be cool with it, right? The same thing happens as an adult. The same thing happens as an adult. When we grow up, we feel like we gotta fit into the world and 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 mold ourselves to what the rest of the world is doing. You see what I'm saying? So, because we feel like we have to mold ourselves to what the world is providing us, and we feel like we have to compete with our neighbors, we have, we have to compete with others, we start to kind of neglect Bible study. Now it's like a childish thing. Then people start saying, oh, I used to go to Bible study. You ever heard that? Like, people live in, I used to. God doesn't look at what you did yesterday, and the, the, is not looking at what you plan to do tomorrow. He cares about right now. What are you doing right now? You could have gone to, to Bible study like 20, 30 years, but if you stop, you stop. That's what he looks at. It's the same thing. You could have been somewhere else for 30, 40 years. It doesn't matter. But if you're here today, you're here today. You see? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Like, if you came to the church today, we're on the same level. It doesn't matter how many years I've been in the church. It, like, me telling you, I've been in the church. I was the first person at Mari. I'm like, these things, God doesn't look at I, I don't know. I don't know why people talk like that, but God doesn't look at. He looks at what you're doing today. So, we shouldn't look down on like things like Bible study and stuff like that. Once we're old and we we reach a certain level, because discipleship is a lifetime commitment. It's a lifetime commitment. It's not something we should stop when we get a job or because we have like uh, we're not comfortable. You know what I mean? Like people who start coming to Bible study, for example, when they have time. And then when they get a job and like you know their life is kind of heading in a different direction, it's like I don't have time for that anymore. No, it's a lifetime commitment. It's a, if God was here for you in, the, in your hard time, then you have to be there for Him when things are starting to go right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. People come to the church I, like when they're out of a job and, and and like you know like tough tough times. Like people come here to to pray and stuff, and then when things start going north for them, you know they tend to forget who did it. All this blessing for them. We should never be in that predicament. <clears throat> so, why did he pick 12? Well, how are we doing on time? Okay, so number 12, there, there's like special numbers within, like, uh, in, uh, in the Bible. Yes, no, right? There's certain numbers that come often, like, which is one? 
that you guys could think of? What's the number that you Eleven. Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> You're not just counting, by the way. Nineteen in the house. <laughs> Wait, it's like... Um, Alright, so three, five, seven, and... Seven, oh, 21, there's like 70-something, like 21, 72, but 72 is not like a number that comes often, is it? Yeah, so, 12 is another one, 12 is another one, 4 is one. Um, so here's like numbers come up and 12 is one of them 12 is a number that occurs a lot um we're going to look at just two examples because you know uh, we don't have time but uh first one is you guys have to know uh you know abraham Right in Genesis chapter twelve, we get introduced to not Abraham, but who? Abraham. Abraham. We get introduced to Abraham, right? So he was the father of the like he's the father of Israel or the father of the nation. So it, like we talked about this before. I know there's like new people here, but so Abraham is kind of the one who started the Judaism in, in terms of like God wanted somebody. He didn't have anybody to to call his his like child. And he saw Abraham being a, a very faithful person. So he told him, even though he didn't have a child at the time, that he would be a father of many nations. And the prophecy was fulfilled because uh, Abraham's child is? Isaac. Isaac's child is? Who got renamed to? Israel. Israel. Then had 12 kids. Yes, well, let me finish this point. So because he had 12 kids, right? And I know I'm going real super fast, but I, like, you can't stop, you know, like read the Bible. So the, the 12 kids, not all the 12, by the way, had a tribe, but like there were 12 tribes because of his kids. Let's just put it like that. Um, the 12 kids, uh, because of the 12 kids, there were 12 tribes that the nation of Israel had. Are you guys with me? Yes. Are you guys with me? Yes. So the 12 tribes is a, a, is a foreshadow of the 12 disciples. That's what I wanted to get at. Now, the nation of Israel, they're called like in Amharic, Israel Zazaga, which literally means the nation of Israel of the flesh. Of the flesh, because they were like actually Israelites in terms of like their nation. Like we're Ethiopians, they were Israelites. So God chose this nation and told them that he was going to be there. Like he was going to save them and he was going to be born from this particular nation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they're called the nation of Israel. And he saved them, he rescued them all of the time. So they're called Israel the Zazaga. We are called Israel the Zanafs. Zanafs. So like the nation of Israel of the spirit. Okay, let's call it of the spirit. Because now we believe, now that we have faith, just like God chose that nation and protected them, he protects us as his nation because of our faith. So we are now citizens of the nation of Israel and son of self, our faith. Does that make sense? So, like, if you guys, I'm sure you guys know, in the Old Testament, he, like, God really loved and cared for the nation of Israel. And when they went to war, and we talked about this before, when other nations went to war in the Old Testament, it wasn't like they were just going to war between the United States and North Korea. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So, um, anyway, it's like when, you know, like today when they're going to war, they're going to war, like to win a war, right? Back in the day, it was like my God versus your God. That's what it was. It wasn't just a regular war. It was about, like, whose God was more powerful. So for, like, whenever you guys read and the nation of Israel was defeated, that's a big deal. Because that means God was so upset, he let them lose on purpose. For them, for the nation of Israel, it's like, where's our God? Why did he forsake us? Why did he embarrass us? You know, that's how they're thinking. That's a big deal. So just like he protected the nation of Israel... We're saying in the New Testament, because of our faith, we become a nation like the Israel of the spirit of our faith. Does that make sense? So the 12 tribes, like there was in the Old Testament, is a foreshadow of the 12 disciples. Because it was because of, it was because of the 12 disciples that this nation of Israel of the spirit was created. Does that make sense? Good question, sir. Um, yeah, I was saying, like, why does Ishmael often, or Ishmael, why is he often 
Like ignore it when we talk about. <clears throat> so that's a great point. He's actually um, because what happened is uh, in in the New Testament when Paul talks about it, he wasn't recognized. Now Abraham, after he was renamed, was supposed to have a child with Sarah, even though Abraham already had another child with his worker, right? And then that's where Ishmael uh, came from. Now, because that wasn't like the legitimate, yeah, that wasn't the son that was recognized. It wasn't, uh, you know, like it wasn't recognized. Now, if you go to uh, Islam, they think that the prophecy was given not to Isaac, but Ismail. So it is like uh, Muhammad is like his grand, 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 grand son or whatever, like that. that, that lineage goes to, towards them. So that's why they think they're, they're correct. They believe in Abraham too, but then they say like it went towards uh, Ishmael. Now, when it comes to Jesus, they still think that came from Isaac, by the way. I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, but I'm saying like in Christianity, this, like Ishmael has... Because it, was, it wasn't a... It was, it wasn't so a he general. has no important role? Like, at all. Uh, no, I mean, there's like... Um, there's commentaries that, that are given about what he represents. Like the old oh. mentality... Uh, Jacob being our, uh, my Isaac being the, the new, like the New Testament versus the Old Testament, or like sin versus righteousness. So there's like that symbolism that's also there. Yes? So why, like, I have two questions. Okay. So how were are, how are other nations created? And you said. What, what do you mean, how are they created? Like, because I'm thinking Adam and Eve had kids, and yeah. they had kids, and then they had kids. Why would Israel like how did just so so what happened is so so what happened is uh, Adam and Eve in the Bible have kids. How many kids did they have? No, they had a lot. Um so so Cain killed Abel and then when Abel was killed, what happened? Nobody knows? They had another kid. Seth. Seth Seth had it. So what happened is Seth was called the child of God. And then uh, Cain was called, like, Cain's children were called the children of man, and then Seth's children were called the children of God. Now, if you guys go to Genesis chapter 6, it says, don't have, like, the children of God had relations with the children of men, meaning the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Seth started relations with one another, which was a no-no. That was, like, that's what God didn't want because Cain's descendants, if you guys read, like, uh, you know, they, they were, like, not good people. Yeah. Very, very bad people. And then the, the children of Seth were supposed to be the only ones, and they didn't protect it. So there was a flood. Know what happened. It's for everybody. So that because they had uh, relations and stuff like that, God wanted to kind of start over, like, no. So then there was Noah and the eight that were, that were saved. Now, the Noah's kid, three of them, went out into different area, and then started establishing their own nations. And then, and then, and then so that's how we go. Well, I mean, there's like eight people. <laughs> but Noah, so Noah's children, Noah's children already had their wife. They brought their wife. Into right. Yeah. And then they're, you know, their kids. <laughs> We're all cousins. <laughs> all right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Um, oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the other 12, um, you know, without getting too much into the story, you guys remember in the book of the book of Numbers, we have the 12 tribes go to like, so when Moses uh, saved like the nation of Israel, what happened? He told them that there's a promised land. Like, I'm going to show you guys this promised land, right? Canaan, you guys remember that, right? So in Canaan, there were like these like big like, uh, people, whatever, the scary looking folks, you know what I'm saying, they were thugs, you know, and probably carried guns of their kind, you know, so like, you know, like they were gangs, basically, they were, they were scary looking folks, so the, these, like the Israelites who just got rescued, who just crossed the Red Sea, who just saw the power of God, started doubting God, they were like, it's better if we were uh, slaves, it's better if we had died, because now we're going to go into this land and we're going to die, and then they started doubting, so what Moses did was, he selected, am I right? Yes, I'm right. Mm -hmm. But what Moses did was, Moses selected 12 people, one from each tribe, tribe to go and survey this land, this promised land, that they, they were told that they were going to go into. 
Is it like, what does the land look like? Is it promising? Is it worth traveling there and stuff like that? You, you guys making sense, right? Mm -hmm. So then um, the 12 people go and then they see and then um, they, they come back. And then 10 of them report, uh, we shouldn't go anymore because the people are scary looking and like we're not going to make it, we're all going to die. Two of them say, nope, you should keep going. God is with us. We're going we're gonna to make it. So the nation of Israel sided with the 10 people and they said, nope, like we should go back, like we're never going to make it. So God spoke up and he said, hey, you guys didn't listen to me, um, so you will not make it to the promised land. Instead, you're going to wander around for 40 years. Your kids will make it to the promised land. But you will not. And this is how the wandering around for 40 years happened. Make sense, right? Now, the 12 people who were spies and were sent to that promised land are representing the 12 tribes. You guys see, right? Because, because the 12 spies went in to survey this promised land, just like the 12 disciples were teaching us about the gospel in this world. And we have an idea of what that promised land looks like because of them. Does that make sense? They're giving a testimony about that promised land in heaven, just like the 12 spies went and testified about the 12, uh, or the promised land of Canaan. Make sense? Make sense? Good question, sir. I think you just answered it. I was just wondering, like, why they were scared to fight the Canaanites, because I thought Israel was, like, in a different area, not where the Canaanites are. But apparently the promised land was Canaan itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah that's so is Israel, like, present-day Canaan, or is it, like... So, Israel, I don't know. I don't want to answer that. I don't know. I don't know. But... Uh, one other thing that I forgot for you know for your knowledge, so up until the kingdom of Solomon, there was just the nation of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. Now Solomon's son uh, Roboam, uh, at that point there was a split between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You guys have to know this. Actually, I think I'll get to it later. Maybe not. So let me say it now. Now the southern kingdom composed of two tribes. The tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. The rest of the kingdom were in the northern kingdom. Now, this is what happened. In the northern kingdom, uh, foreigners came and they had relations with them. They got married and stuff like that. Because they had relations with them, their Judaic teaching started getting like compromised. And a lot of the things that they were doing became compromised. Now, the capital city of the northern kingdom is, guess what? Samaria. Right? Hence, the Samaritans are from Samaria. Now, if you guys read the Bible, whenever it talks about Samaritans, how do they talk about them? Very horrible. Very bad. Why? Because the Samaritans, the southern kingdom, which kept their Judaic teaching, they see the northern kingdom as the fake Jews. The Jews who gave up their culture. The Jews who gave up their religion. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. This is why our fathers today, they're very skeptics about marrying with other faith. Think about it, right? Because whenever we are marrying somebody else, what do you think is going to happen in our spiritual life? If nothing else, it starts to? Yeah. If we can teach them and bring them to our faith, great. If not, it's something to think about. It's something to think about because that's what happened as a nation, the northern kingdom. Of the northern kingdom. Um, all right, let's keep going. Uh, other questions? Other questions? Gave them authority. Christ casted out evil spirits, healed the disease and illness. Okay, so he gave them authority. He gave them authority. And he gave them the authority to cast out evil spirits, heal disease and illness. But he, uh, so Christ did the same thing, right? Are you guys with me? Christ did the same thing. But when Christ was doing the same exact miracles that the disciples were doing, he was doing it by his own power. That's your fill in the blank. He was doing it by his own power. Now, the disciples are, are also uh, healing the sick and, and, and performing, performing all these miracles. But the difference between them and Christ is what? He's doing it by his own power. They're doing it by Christ. his name. They're invoking Christ's name in the name of Christ. I demand you to come out, right? He does it in his power. In fact, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon of the Mount, what does he do? Like, the, the books say this, but I tell you. Uh, we talked about this many times, right? This is big. This is like a huge deal in, 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 in uh, Judaic teaching. 
you do not say, I tell you, opposing the books, you know? And th that's what it came out as. When, he, when Christ was saying, the books say this, but I tell you this, he's saying, I have more power than the books. So he's speaking with authority. This is very, very big, and, and, and it's, it's something that we should, you know, look at carefully. So again, uh, they became his disciples. Uh, the miracles are indicative of his disciples. Uh, discipleships uh, that they received or the power that they received. So today, there's not a lot of people who have never heard of the gospel. People may not believe in it. People may not understand it. People may have opinions about it. But people have heard about the gospel. People have an understanding of who Christ was. People understand what Christianity is about. Back then, this is a new phenomenon. So here, they need to go and like start a movement, if you will. And in order to do that, th these miracles were there to show them that God was on their side. You see? So when they go and they say, we are teachers, of, uh, we are the disciples of Christ, and we can prove it, and they do miracles and they show it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Today, today, because the, like, we know about Christ, all we have to do is preach it. That's why, like, if you guys see, miracles are not around anymore because we're not in need of it. We know what happens. It, I'm not saying miracles never happen, but we're not in need of it like they were back in the day. Because they're like proposing something very new, something that the world has never seen before. So the miracles were indicative of the fact that they had actually indeed received power from Christ himself. Uh, the, but here what we need to learn is the disciples had the miracles to show the rest of the world that they in fact were disciples of Christ. How do we show the rest of the world that we're disciples? You see? The way we show it is through the life that we live. Uh, we talk about this in class. A true Christian is somebody who can preach the gospel without saying a word. Right? As somebody, a true Christian is somebody who can preach the gospel without saying a word. If you guys read the book of Acts, uh, I, I believe it was Peter. I'll be corrected uh, if I'm not. But I think it was Peter. Right after he uh, ended teaching about Christ, and he was telling them Christ was, uh, he performed miracles. He was a holy, uh, you know, he was holy uh, leader. He led us all. He did this. He did that. He did this. And then when he finished teaching, all the people said, you are Christ. And then Peter got mad, and he ripped his shirt, and he's telling everybody, I'm not Christ. I'm a sinner. Right? Like, I'm not, I'm not to be compared with Christ. Like, I'm not Christ at all. He's getting upset. Now, in today's age, right, we have to convince other people that we're holy. In, 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 in Peter's case, he had to convince people he was a sinner. You see? Because people thought he was Christ. Not like, like Christ, but they thought he was Christ. So he was getting mad and telling them, no, I am a sinner. Please believe me. In this day and age, we have to convince other people that we're Christians. You ever tell people like I go to I go to church or something? Like, you you go to church? You no way. I promise I do. I'm a holy person. I read my Bible. I fast, right? So now we have to convince people that we are Christians. But a true disciple, just by the way that they live their life, they should be able to preach it for everybody else. And then if you guys know, there's other people when they say, I go to church, like I knew it. It makes sense. Like, just because of the way they live, right? Like, they don't have to say anything. Just, just by the way they act, you're like, it's not a surprise. Right? So, what about us? How do we declare to the world that, in fact, we are Christians? In fact, that the Holy Spirit is working through us. And it's by the way we act, by the way we talk, by the way we interact with the rest of the world. So, that needs to be uh, indicative of who we are. Uh, let's keep going. <clears throat> The name of the twelve disciples. The name of the twelve disciples. Okay, we're going to leave it on the um, time. Please, I'm going to leave it on the time. Can I teach? The name of the twelve disciples. If you guys see and read like their bio, uh, the twelve disciples were very young, with the exception of Peter. Most of them were probably like early 20s, late, late teens or something like that. Like very, very young. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. Fishermen, we talk about tax collectors. That means what? 
They were doing very bad things. Bad things. That's what I mean. Um, fisherman means uneducated. That means simple. Whenever you guys are reading about fishermen, that means they were men out. So the fishermen were very simple folks. So the people that Christ is choosing to establish Christianity are tax collectors, young folks, and fishermen. Like these are the ones who are going to establish the best thing that has ever been established, something like the pillar of the world, something that's going to like stand forever, like these 12 are it. You would think you would gather like the smartest people on earth, like with the highest IQs and stuff like that, right? Like check their resume and, and see how many times they've been praying and stuff like these like tax collectors. Like they don't even fit the, the, the ideal deacon. We, you know what I mean? Like for like for a deacon, we probably think of someone known like you, someone who prays and and what. These were people who lied, cheated, and then fought and simple, uneducated, didn't know anything. You guys are gonna establish the church. That's what he told. Them. He called them. His criteria is different from ours. His criteria is heart. He looks at the heart. How's your heart like? Are you ready to listen? Are you ready to learn? Are you ready to leave everything behind? He doesn't care what you have in your mind and like what you're studying and what your status is and all that. He doesn't care. So when you come to the body, when you come to the church, come clean. Don't try to like lean on your other things that you have in your own like life and think that's what's going to make you survive in the church. No, it's not that. You have done nothing to be here. God has showed you. You see what I'm saying? And what he wants is your clean heart. As long as you have a clean heart, he'll take you places. In ways that you can't even imagine. And that's what he did for them. Is that even though they were simple. Even though they weren't educated. He still chose them. Because they were ready to accept him. And they were able to fulfill the mission because of him. If you guys see he changes some of their name. The, the changing of the name actually. Uh, if you guys go to like Um, Like in Ethiopia. Like where you know like. You guys know what Kolotomethrit is right? The, the school of uh, <laughs> peanuts. <laughs> and, uh, what's the call of cashews? No, it's not cashews. No. The mix of cashews and peanuts. The school of uh, cashews and peanuts. I know it's the school of peanuts. It's barley. Actually, barley. It's barley. The school of barley. Yeah. And the school of barley. Call it to me. Back home. Back home. Right. Where, like, the priests go and, like, they're learning, like, all this stuff. Uh, they actually changed their name. You guys know that? No. Like, my teacher's name was Hawaz, for example. Wait, the teacher changed the name of the students? Uh, like, the, when you go in, the teacher changes your name, and you keep that name. Oh, okay. So, like, my teacher, I was, I was I with him for, like, teacher. no. So, so, my teacher's name was Mehmet Hawaz. So, like, first of all, you don't. Say Mamir, you don't say Mr. Hawaz. That's Shawaz. No, you say Yenita. Yenita Hawaz. That's what that's the like this. I have no idea why it's been. <laughs> no idea. But like Yenita, like you know, like Yen yeah, no. Yen like why? Yeah, like yeah, it's like, you know, that's these. You're recording this. I got it. So 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 we go and then like, you know, I've been I was with him for like two years and like Oh, you need to tell husband I've been, and then come to find out that's not his real name. Like, oh my gosh. Like, what? And they don't even think about their previous name. 
they take it very seriously, like they're, and then, uh, it's not common in Kenny, so that's why I don't have like a new name, but like uh, in the aqua, aqua, like in other like school or classes, or whatever, like my friends who we finished Kenny together, I used to communicate with them, their name has changed. I'm like, hey, Batra, salam. I'm like, <laughs> Batra. No, it was my old to me. <laughs> 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 I am so I was like, whoa. So they actually changed their name. Now, here's the point that I wanted to get to. The reason why they changed their name is to show once you're with Christ, you have a new beginning. He changes you. Do you see what I'm saying? He changes your name. He changes everything about you. So, <laughs> we all have done things not too good. Right? And some of us may even have like a name outside of the church, like we're known for something. You know, some people are known for like, oh, that person is the one who did this, 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 this. But we may have a background that's like very shameful. Share one or two of them. <laughs> Just tell us about that one you told me last time. It's pretty. I <laughs> you, really, you really did love it. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Once you come to the church, do not, do not let that bother you. They like come, confess, confess your sins. Tell a priest. Once you've done that, you have a new beginning. Do not let your background kind of hold you back. You know, and that, that's the thing, like, that's what the devil does, and, and remember that. We always talk about this, too. The devil always tells you, it's not a big deal. Do this, do this, do this, and he, try, he, to, he tries to get you to do, like, a horrible sin. Once you do it, he'll tell you, you're not worth it. I can't believe you just did this. You're not even worth the grace of God. And he tries to convince you never to come back to church. That is the work of God. Do not listen to that. And other people, and your so-called friends or your old friends or whatever, they might like, oh, you're going to church? We know who you are. No, you don't. God knows who I am. You see? Like, people, don't let your old past, like, carry you forward wherever you go. You have a new beginning once you're with God. Forget about the rest of the stuff that happened back in the day. Forget it. Let it go. It's done. Now, you have a new beginning. Um, that's why he changed their name. <clears throat> uh, notice that in the list of names, Matthew refers to to himself as a tax collector. <laughs> so like, he's changing the names, like Christ is changing their name. But Matthew is changing his, uh, or he kept that like uh, adjective to describe himself as the tax collector. The reason why he's doing this is not because he's dwelling in the past like I mentioned, but he wants to remember how big God is, how much he can change your story. You see? He's letting his, he's reminding himself, I once was a tax collector, but here I am, my name listed part of the 12. He didn't take himself out of the 12 uh, apostles or disciples. He put himself in. But when he did it, he still put tax collector to say, I started out as a tax collector, now I'm a disciple. Now I'm an, I'm an apostle. All because Christ called me and changed my story. Right? And think about how much he has changed our story just by calling us and bringing us here. We had nothing to do with it. This is why. This is why. Whenever we talk about, like, the church, like, it needs people, right? Like, it needs people. But whenever we talk about it needs people, like, come and serve, like, we have to serve. If we want this thing to grow. If you don't do it, God will replace somebody else by your name. Like, he will replace you. You are replaceable. But we should be happy that we are part of this blessing. It's not, we're not here to help the church. We're here to help ourselves. You see what I'm saying? It is us who benefit from serving God, not the other way around. This is what Matthew recognizes. Christ did this for me. Let's keep going. And then notice how he refers to Judas. Uh, he refers to him as the one who later betrayed him. Uh, if it was me, I would have been like, uh, Judas, the jerk, or like <laughs> Judas, like the one I hate and I can't stand, or like, you know, or something, right? He says, Judas, the one who betrayed him later. What he's saying here is, number one, there is a need to, act in a, to add an adjective, adjective, <laughs> adjective to Judas because there was another Judas, and he wants to set the like, record straight as to which Judas he's referring to. This is the one who later betrayed him. Second, he's simply telling us a story. Notice, he's not like giving us opinions about Judas. He's simply stating a fact that happened. 
the reason why I'm bringing this up is we have to understand that when we like disagree with people, name calling is not appropriate. Even if it is a religion difference. You see? Like, in your schools or whatever, you might have a debate with somebody who may not agree with you. How do you talk to them? Like, even if it's like, I don't like, if somebody wants to upset you about Christianity, what's the first thing they're going to start doing? Bash? Who? God. God. No, the Virgin Mary. Right? Especially for Ethiopians. That's like how you get them under their skin. That's the first thing. Maybe that chat come out what? You know, like, and people just like, that's how you piss off an Ethiopian. Like, one American said, a few... Uh, see the blood of uh, an Ethiopian. Uh, it has something in there that makes them be late everywhere, and it has something in there that says Mariam, Mariam, Mariam all the time. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. like, that's the two traits he learned about us. And it's true. <laughs> Both of them. But, like, whenever we're having, especially a spiritual discourse, name calling is not okay. Get your point across, stand firm in your faith. And declare what you believe in without name calling. With love for the other person. Like, we should be thinking, this person is like, oh, like, he's, like that's my brother. You know, that's my sister. Like, she's falling. Not like, how dare you say this? you like, you're the devil. You work with... Like, these things are not going to help anybody. They're not going to help anybody. So, when we talk, we talk facts. Just like Judas did. The one who betrayed him later. So, we can say, no, the Virgin Mary, she intercedes for us. We love her. Christ is our Lord and our Savior. We believe in him. He died for us. He saved us. We, we claim that. But we don't go into name calling and say, oh, this person is this, this person is that, this person is this. That is not Christian. That is not what the apostles taught us. That is not what the Bible teaches us. Let's keep going. Uh, the 12 are sent with instructions. The 12 are sent with instructions. Which one do we have? Pace. Okay, when we become servants of the Lord, we have to serve God in the way that pleases Him. In the way that we pleases Him. We kind of touched up on this earlier. We are here to serve whom? Sometimes we feel like we're here to serve ourselves. And the reason why I say this is, if, we, if there's service that we don't, that we don't like, we don't really, like, we don't have a place to give an opinion about a service. Does that make sense? Like, if there's a need to go out in a hot day and pass out flyers, for example, like you did, that nobody came to, <laughs> right? I'm just giving an example. <laughs> we are not in a position to say, that makes, like, me, like, I'm hot when I do that. I mean, like, you can disagree with it in terms of, like, the service and say, this is not an effective service because it's not, like, the right way to... But you can have an opinion about that. But to say, like, I'm tired, or, like, oh, it's like the weather is too hot, or it's raining, that's not okay. That, that's not okay. We're not in a position to give an opinion about these things. Because we're here, whatever the need is, we have to go and serve. Like I said, you can have an opinion about the service itself, and why, like, you had a question about the service. You're like, it's not effective as the service and stuff. That is different as, as far than saying, I'm too tired, or I don't want to walk around, or like, it, there's a difference between two. Am I clear? Or, there's a need to do whatever it may be, we have to serve in the way that pleases them. Having said that, the other problem that we have is, we don't mind serving our friends. Like, if a friend of ours says, I have a question about the Bible, can you come to my house? Short sure thing we go over, right? The next week, somebody that we may not really like. And that's okay, by the way. Like, uh, there's a lot of people in this world, and we're not expected to like everybody. You guys know that, right? We're expected to love everybody, but we're not expected to get along with everybody. We're not expected. You guys know that. The Bible said, if you can, try to get along with everybody. Why the if you can? Because it's very hard. To. And it's okay to say, you know what? Like, me and you, we just don't see eye to eye. We disagree. Like, still have love for one another and say, on this subject, we just don't get along, it's okay. And, and the Bible says that it's okay. Um, now, let's say it's one of those people that you really don't get along with. In fact, we're going to push it one more step further and says, 
that person really gets under your skin. But then they call you and say, hey, I need you because I have questions. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Like, no, I can't. Like, ask somebody else. It's service. If we went for our friends, we should go for this person. You see? And then that's the thing. Serving for people versus serving for God. There's a difference. There's a difference. We serve God. So whenever the need comes, that person, whatever they look like, whatever they do, dumb touch, whatever it is, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. If we're there truly for God, we'll be on God. Make sense? Let's keep going. Um, when we become servants of the Lord, we have to serve God in the way that pleases Him. We were talking about that. Uh, so then he says, uh, he's giving them instructions. He says, don't go to the Gentiles or Samaritans. We talked about what the Samaritans are, right? And I get to skip all this part because I already talked about it. So we guys, we know what who the Samaritans are, right? Because we just talked about it. The Gentiles are people who did not accept Judaism at all. Samaritans are the ones who accepted it in the beginning, but after having uh, intermarriage, their Judaic teaching kind of started falling apart because they assimilated with the foreigners. The Gentiles are the ones who never accepted Judaism to begin with. Now, Christ is telling them, do not go and teach to the Gentiles and the Samaritans. Why? Why would he say that? Well, let's look at it. Because it was the Jews who had been waiting for him for many, many years to come. The prophecies were written for the Jews, meaning the servant, southern kingdom, and they were the ones who had been like preserving the teachings of Judaism. So when Christ came, they were waiting for him. For them, for the twelve disciples, to go to the rest of the nation and teach about Christ would have gave the Jews an excuse not to accept. Are you guys with me? So now here's the Jews. They were waiting for them, for Christ. But then the disciples go and then they teach the gospel to other people. Well, the Jews here, they're going to say, we didn't accept Christianity, right? Europe? Okay. Uh, they're going to say, we didn't accept Christianity. And they're going to say, why didn't you accept Christianity? And they say, we never heard about it. Nobody taught us. Like, you went to the other nations and you went and you taught all those people, you never came to us. Right? They would have an excuse not to be Christians. So what Christ did in order to avoid all of this is, he first sent them to the Jews because they were waiting for him. They were waiting for him to come. And they were the, mo the ones most likely to, to convert, but they didn't, actually. They, gave, they were the ones who gave, like, the hardest time. So, like, um, once they said no, as we see in Matthew chapter 28, he sends them to the whole, like, all, he says, all nations, go baptize uh, and make them disciples in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to all the nations. So here, he's not contradicting himself. What go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Gentiles, Samaritans mean is... Go to the Israelites first, and then go to the rest of the nations. Go to the, the nation of Israel first, and then go to the rest of the nations. Make sense? Again, he gave them authority. Christ, uh, we looked at that. We looked at this. Oh, wow. We're doing pretty good. Interesting fact. Who's the first Gentile baptized? Who's that? Jesus. Jesus. Uh, first Gentile. Christ wasn't baptized. Oh. Um. Cornelius. How'd you know, smart man? I'm just smart. <laughs> <laughs> Book of Acts chapter 7, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. He said, uh, announce the kingdom of heaven is near. Since Jesus Christ has died for us on the cross, the, king, the kingdom that once was closed due to our sins is now open. When Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And then what happened? And then what happened? They were just kicked out. What happened to the gate of the Garden of Eden? It was closed, right? Nobody could get in. Now, because Christ was going to die, and because he was going to defeat death, what happened to the gate? It opened. So now, it is, it is near means we have access to the kingdom of heaven, but we still have to go in. We still have to go in. Um, here's the thing about faith and action. For example, uh, we talk about um, like college, right? 
and you apply and stuff like that, and you get accepted. You get your acceptance letter. Does that mean you graduated? <laughs> right? Does that mean, like, your acceptance letter, you still, even before getting, but it's not enough just to go and, and talk about the gospel. You've got to start helping other people. Does that make sense? Where, wherever you guys see, like, an opportunity to help, outside of Christians, outside of Christians, they don't have to be Christians. We've got to take initiative to actually care about people and to actually try to make a difference even in our neighborhood, even in our family, wherever the case is, whenever there's an opportunity to help, we've got to help because the gospel, uh, we're not expected to preach just by word. We have to preach by the actions of what we do. Does that make sense? So you don't really need a mic in order to go and preach. Uh, you can, like, through your actions, again, you can preach. And this is a, a thing that we keep uh, saying over and over. Give as freely as you have received. Give as freely as you have received. So you've been learning about the gospel freely. You haven't paid for this, right? So we should be able to do the same for other people. Now here's the thing. Uh, mind you, like, we're not just talking about preaching in terms of like the, like the word. I've been, you've been saying that all day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and give freely doesn't just mean in terms of money. It doesn't mean in terms of money. It means give freely, like, like everything. So, like, every single time, every single time, uh, somebody comes up to you. Let's say, if you've been serving the church, you know, and, like, your family starts to recognize, and then people will start talking about it, right? And the first thing I promise you that's going to happen is people are going to tell you about their, their kids, and then they're going to approach you and say, like, it's already happening, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like, so-and-so, like, my kid is, like, he's a good kid, I promise. What? His friends are bad. And then he just needs a little bit of like, uh, like talk. Like, can you talk to him, right? You guys ever got that? Yeah. It happens all the time. Like, just just give him some advice. If you've never got that, that means you're probably back. <laughs> 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 that means you're you're the problem child. <laughs> um, so when that happens, if every single time people come up to you and ask you for especially service, and your response is like, ah, oh, like I'm so like. Busy, like you don't like I, I want to, but they're having to pay the price of hearing your complaint. That means you're making them pay for it. It's not about money, it's about like you complaining in itself, you're making them pay for it. Did Christ complain? Like we saw in Matthew chapter 9, how many times he just went, like, my child is sick, can you hear that? Okay, can you do this? Okay, can you do this? Okay, like all day he was just going around. Okay, okay, he gave free. And just like I gave you freely, he said, give freely. So if every single time when somebody is giving us, like, when we have an opportunity to serve, and we're complaining about it, like, then we're making them pay for it. We shouldn't have to be begged to serve. We should serve freely. That's what it means. Serve freely. Give freely. Give your time freely. God looks at it, he'll pay you back and forth. Um... Don't take money in a traveler's bag. So he's talking about here, when you go out of town, uh, don't take a traveler's bag and don't put, like he says, gold, silver, or copper points. Now, it's, <laughs> next time I go to Kansas, you guys are going to lick me. Because right? it's like, where, why do you have a traveler's bag? You have a change of clothes in it. Now here's the thing. Are you guys with me? Are you guys with me? Yeah. Um, this is the thing, so like the Bible, if you're looking at like just the black and white, you know, that's written in there, you're missing the point. It's what these things are representing that we're looking at. Now notice what he talks about here. Number one, he talks about gold, silver, co copper coins. Number one, number one. When we are servants, right, we're not meant to be showy, you know, like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to get into something else, but like, you know, what we see in TV, for example, and, and those in ministry, I know it doesn't, like, most of you guys are like, why are you telling me this, but Christianity is not a showy religion. This is not something, like, to attract folks, you know, like, you got, like, good stuff and, like, prosperity, preaching, you guys know what it is? Well, I'm not going to say anything because we're being recorded, but you are right. <laughs> 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 so, 
so, so, so, we're not like meant to be show because this is not something to attract people. Like, whenever you go in, into the world in general, you don't want to be seen. The goal is for you not to be seen, but for Christ to be seen. If you're showy and you got all these things going on, then people are looking at you instead of Christ. Yeah. And then people start like following you instead of Christ. All right? Mm -hmm. It is because of my humidity I dress like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not because I can't dress better. <laughs> Most um, <laughs> most person you know, right? <laughs> yeah, question. Um, I Well, I don't want to get into that, but uh, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to say all mega churches are wrong, but. Whenever you start driving a BMW, you know, especially in, in, in people who are doing this are like serving the poor, like you're supposed to be with your people, right? And you, how can you relate if you have a mansion? How are you relating with that person? BMW is for the private planes. And you know, private planes and stuff like that. Like, how are you relating with a person? Um, and, and how are you making that? That means you're, you're working the people. Um, and stuff like that, yeah. So do you mean to say that anybody? So, so, so do you mean to say that anybody who like uh, studies, you know, Christian scholarship or anything isn't entitled to own nice material things like that? Look, all I'm saying is, if we're materialistic, there's a problem, right? So like, I'm not saying you can't get a house, like, mm -hmm. but especially if you got to start asking. You need to look like a congregation. You, you can't profit out of the gospel. And, and, and if you can't at least match, you, need, you don't need to be lower, but you can't be higher. Right? Because that means you're profiting. If, if anything, you should lean towards the lower. Because we're, we're promised another like kingdom. Right? But live okay. Like you shouldn't have to suffer and stuff. And, and I'll get into that later on. Um, about how much like the congregation is asked to support the, the clergy because they literally have nothing else unless the you know the congregation is supporting them. They have to live, they have to eat, they're human beings. Like, we tend to forget that and I'm gonna get to that in a second. But whenever you profit out of the gospel and you're li you're living like above means and above your congregation level, um, then there's something wrong with it. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. But yeah, no, there's just cases where some people are given these things as gifts, or you know, like you know, maybe very famous priests and things like that. In and general, if you study like most of their life, right? Um, for example, they say I wrote a book and stuff like that. If it's true, if a truly gospel like book, give it for free. Yeah. yeah. You know, like don't like why do you have a mansion and like four or five cars? Like write a great book and give it for free. You know what I mean? And, and stuff like that. Because what happens is, guess what you start chasing? Money. Money and this is the problem. Yeah, then you start chasing the wrong things. You know what I mean? And, and, and this is not really, you know, something that we have to worry about. But it's something that we have to uh, mention. You have to pay for a Bible. I'm not saying, again, live normal is what I told you. Okay. Yeah, no, I got it. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think it does fall on your attention at the end of the day. It's not like why you're spending money, because it, you know, if you have a corrupted heart, then obviously, you know, you'd be spending money in the wrong way. Right. And the reason I ask the question is because you'll have like a doctor, right? Let's say it's like somebody in our community. Mm. You'll have a doctor who rolls in here with a Rolls Royce, and then you'll have people judging him, like, why is this person driving that car? We we we're yeah. we're talking about like servants of Christ. Yeah, that's why I asked that question. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So yeah. a doctor is, you know, but even a doctor, for example, um. And whatever field that we are in, we're asked just to humble ourselves. We, we, we live a, a life of humility, regardless of where we are. Um, uh, whenever we start going for the materialistic things, again, people will start to look at this. Is it impressive if a doctor has like a BMW or, or like a, a very nice car? No. Is it impressive if he drives like a very low car? Yes. It is, it, it is, it is impressive. Like, if like he's a, a, a CEO of, a, of like a huge company or whatever, 
And you see him driving like a Toyota Corolla. No, really though. She's in her car. And you see that? Won't, won't that catch your eye? If you ask that person, are you guys with me? If you ask that person, why are you driving a Toyota Corolla? He says, I instead of buying that money that I was gonna use for the car, I gave it for the poor. Now you have this, you have the attention. Is he preaching the gospel? Mm -hmm. You see? Like that's what I'm saying. It's like I, I'm not saying always be put like down or whatever, but live normal. We ask to live normal, not be low. You don't have to like always go to pay less and get the like, what's the cheapest shoes you have? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> you're not you're not asked to do that. Live normal. If you're buying like, you know, eight hundred, nine hundred dollar shoes, just ask yourself. Uh, uh, like again, yeah, what would Christ do, right? What would Jesus do? Yeah, what would, what would I change that around? Yes, sir. Um, there was a sofa that I was listening to, and then the priest was talking about. It was actually kind of like the opposite of what you're originally talking about in terms of like, um, don't be showy. Like this sofa was kind of the opposite because apparently he's wrong. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Like the context though was like apparently in Ethiopian culture because of that teaching, a lot of people like during its own like they make themselves look. Yeah, like they'll make themselves look poor and stuff, just to just so that other Christians can say, "Oh, wow, that's a real Christian." Like, they they're making exactly. themselves. So notice, notice how, just notice just how, the and, and, and like he's teaching against that. So notice how I'm telling you to live normal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The teaching is live normal, not below, not below, but normal, right? So you look at the congregation and you live at that level is what you should aim for, not higher, not lower. Yeah. Never mind, because when I thought about it, we were recording. Okay. No, no, it's not that. It's just like every, every society has a different Okay, sorry. <laughs> Alright, good. It's gonna come. It's gonna come. No, I'm just saying, every society. <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay, every society has their own normal. So, like, you're saying live normal, so, like, is America it's normal? Or, like, because if you go to Ethiopia. Like, no, I mean, normal to where you live, right? So, like, you can't live like WWE because you got all got to take off our shoes, and I don't think y'all want to see my feet. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so like, you, you got you got to live according to you know where you live at. Okay. Uh, question again. It's okay. So the idea is to humble ourselves, right? Right. So if we, why can't we go higher while humbling? How is that even possible? Like, like, improving, like, get, like, why can't you get, like, why can't you get more money than you already have while still being humble? I think you improve yourself. And, and what, so it's not about getting. Notice, I said live according to that. I didn't say anything about acquiring money. What are you going to do with the money? Is a question, right? Whenever you're buying things for yourself and, and then you start acquiring all these things, people are looking at you now. Right? And then you're saying, this is where I value my things. You see what I'm saying? This is where I put so much value to is this. And you're preaching by your actions. And that's the teaching that you're giving to other people. Um, but if you learn, and then like, uh, I'm, I'm talking about like in terms of school and whatever, you got a higher education, got a good job, and you're humbling yourself. The people are going to look at you and say, why do you do this? And then you say, because the gospel is more important. Now you are preaching by your actions. That's what it means. But whenever you're like showing everything that you do, you want people are looking at you and not about Christ. And they're not looking at Christ. And that's the mistake that we make. Right? Because those who are not able, let's say you get you make it and you make a lot of money, you start like being classy and going to like church and stuff like that. Somebody who's poor, who admires you, would say, I can never be on his level because I'm poor. You see what I'm saying? And it's like some, it's going to give a different connotation or whatever, yeah. What if you're living lavish, but your intention isn't to put that over the gospel? Mm -hmm. So it's like the way people view you, they might think, oh, she values the classy life over the gospel. But in your heart, you value mm -hmm. the gospel over being classy, but you're still like driving a Range Rover or whatever mm -hmm. it is the case may be. So, so they got God knows I think, your yeah. But that's the whole thing. So when we preach, we preach by our actions, not just by like, mm -hmm. our actions matter. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, I see what you're saying, like, and it's, it's like our heart, and God looks at our heart. There are times when we invoke that, and then there are times where we say, no, our actions is also what matters. There's, people look at the end of the day, and what do you want that message to be? For example, 
even if you're acquiring all these materialistic things, like the, uh, the Desert Fathers. The de Desert Fathers, what they used to do is they used to collect the money, they used to get like the, like, in modern day, they would drive all those cars that you're talking about. They would buy it, they wouldn't even drive it, they would buy it. And then when they're like at the top level, they would give it to the world. And they would become a monk. And that was kind of like, they did, but they did it with a goal. The goal to give up all these things after they acquired it. So if you're, if you're talking about like a mission of some sort of this, this is something else. But most of the time, we're not buying like nice shoes and nice clothes to do that with it, right? We're not buying it just to give it up. Are we? No, we're not. But that's what, that's what the Desert Fathers did. It's like they purposely, like their entire life was dedicated to like getting, acquiring all these materialistic things, learning the highest degree that they can learn, and then showing the world, I have done everything that you're searching, and it's not worth it. And they give it back to the world. Um, that's a different mission than what we're talking about. No, it's I'm just saying, I think what you said makes sense, especially what you said earlier, like what would Christ do? Right. Uh, if you look at what Christ did, like he could have been born to any family in this world, right. like a rich family, like he did not have to go through what he went through. But he chose like the poorest people, like, the, you know, it was like even his disciple with like bones and stuff, you know what I mean? Like it's just like not the people that he would choose whatever. So for him, like, to put himself that low, but then you're preaching his word, it doesn't make sense for you to go and then live, like, a lavish lifestyle if you're preaching his word. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, right. you're just, that is a way to do My question is, what if you attribute all that success and all the hard work you put in and thank God for all of that and show that, like, I've gotten this through God? That's, that that's exactly the problem, right? Yeah. Because we're equating success by the materials that we have acquired. And that is at the heart of the problem of the world. It's because we are saying, like, if you talk about blessings, for example, and this is the prosperity teachings, is people equate success with nice cars, nice house, and that's everything. That is not success. Who said that was success? Right? Who said that was success? And this is the thing, and that's why it is exactly the problem of prosperity preaching and all that stuff that we're talking about is, like, that's what they tell you, is like, you get success in terms of these things that you're mentioning. And the Bible is here to say that is not success. Live normal, live comfortable, enough to sleep at night and whatever, but when we were talking about, like, above means, above levels, and she said, like, every society is different. Whatever society you're in, live comfortably, comfortably in, that, in, in that society. Success means your relationship with Christ, and that's it. Like, you're blessed because you have family, you're blessed because you're healthy, you're blessed because you have a healthy relationship with Christ. Anything else, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Right? Uh, in the back. I don't think he was saying that, like, he's successful just for, like, if he did have those material things. I think he was just saying, like, if you have the material things and you thank God for them, does that take away from it? Right? Because, like, if you're somebody who's, like, a billionaire, right? I mean, at that point, and you have that car, I mean, you're saying that, so you brought up an example, like, let's say somebody uh, buys a Toyota Corolla and they could have bought a Rolls Royce or something right. really expensive. They say, you know what, I could have given that money to the poor, right? But what if that person is already giving to the poor just as much, and they have the margin, and it is, it is within their means to buy that sort of thing? In my opinion, I mean, obviously, I'm not a person of knowledge or anything, but right. in my opinion, I feel like if you're living within your means, which is extremely subjective to all of us, if you're living within your means and you're still um, holding yourself accountable for mm -hmm. our obligations to the people and things like that, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I, I'm not saying indulge in this life, but I don't think it's a bad thing to you know buy a thing here. But you know. and that's what we are talking about, though. We're not talking about just again like by if you're a billionaire and you have like like you know pretty okay cars or whatever. And, we're getting into specifics now, yeah. right? So we, we are, we, we're really getting into like, like millionaire versus a billionaire. And like, you know, like the point is whenever you start kind of leaning on these things as the reason of your success, right? Whenever you're like looking at your materials and then you're saying, yeah, I made it in life. You've made a mistake, you know, and that, that is the problem. And, and, and that's what, if we're chasing the, these things, then we've made a mistake. And that's, that's the point of the, the lesson. Yeah, um, to add on to what you said, like uh, you said earlier, uh, like people, I, I did a lot of research on prosperity preaching, 
And they say that they got this thing because God blessed them. He's like, you know, if you follow God, He will bless you too. Like, you know, that's like something that is said a lot. But I think that if I saw a person who did get the, like, he got the success, right? Like, I know he's a doctor, and like, like we said earlier, but like he's driving, he's lit, like he's driving a Honda or something, right? No gold, silver, copper coins. These things are valued, right? And we're saying that the gospel is more valuable than the gold, silver, or copper coins. So when we go and travel, we don't need to carry these things because we, and within us, within the gospel, like the gospel is more valuable than gold, silver, or copper coins. So there's no need to carry that with us because we have something more valuable than that. Let's keep going. Uh, he says, don't uh, keep, uh, don't bring with you uh, clothes, uh, sh shoes, or walking stick. Well, why? Let's look at it. Again, it's what they represent. It's not actually, he's not exactly talking about these things. He's talking about what these things represent. Are you guys with me? Mm -hmm. All right. So what do clothes do? They keep us warm. Shoes protect our feet from thrones, thorns. That's wrong. I'm going to watch it too much game. <laughs> Um, they protect our feet from thorns, and, and uh, walking stick uh, protect us like they, we use it to lean on. Now I added it and erased it later on. They actually actually use it for like wild animals, like dogs and stuff. You guys this probably don't know that the sticks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're very important in, in get up. Let me tell you from experience. Uh, if you walk around, especially at night, you need a walking stick. Um, I learned the hard way. <laughs> I learned the hard way. Now, why why these things we don't have we don't have to carry it with us? Why would he say don't carry it with you when you go somewhere else? Well, because the gospel is what will keep us warm. The the gospel is what's going to protect our feet from going into like places where we shouldn't be, which act like thorns to our feet, like our spiritual life, right? Mm -hmm. So the gospel is what's going to protect us from that. The walking stick is our gospel that we will lean on and it will protect us from the wild animals. Or, or the, uh, the, the one that the devil works with and all those like hardships that will come along our way. It is the gospel that's going to protect us. So whenever we lean on, again, worldly things, we're saying that God is not sufficient to protect us from other things. So our attitude and what we should rely on should be solely on Christ. Let's keep going. After he says, don't carry gold, don't carry like clothes, don't do anything, he says, don't hesitate to accept hospitality. Please listen carefully. We come here and we are taking, 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 taking from the church. You've got to give back to the church, especially, especially money. And we're going we to learn about this, uh, like in the future. But -um, but -um, but -um. Like, we laugh around, we joke around, like, oh, the priest, they're asking for money again, oh, oh. You know, and stuff like, like, you know, people, our parents say that and stuff like that, like, oh, daddy, the one that I'm getting stuff, but now. Let's think about it. Let's think about it, right? Believe it or not, priests are human beings. They have family, right? If they're in here 24 7, what do you think, like, is happening? They're not working any, like, they're, one, they're human beings. They got family, they got rent. To pay for they got food they got kids to raise they got like everything else they got so many things to take care of now if we want them to be with us we've got to support them somehow somewhere mm -hmm. right if we're not the ones like giving them money and giving them food and giving them shelter where do you think it's coming from mm -hmm. the way a holiday relationship should be is the priest shouldn't have to ask mm -hmm. the priest shouldn't have to give like the students and the children are the ones who provide. Mm -hmm. The priest will say, no, it's not enough. Like, or it says too much, like take it back. And then the, the, the congregation will say, no, take it. And this is like a healthy relationship. Now it's the reverse because we forgot to give and they're in here. Whenever you guys confess it, and I know most of you guys have like a confessor father, get in the habit of like providing, giving something, like think, you know what I mean? Like whoever it is, trust me, they're in need of it. Like when you go, like want to have like take something with you, like maybe food or like a little bit of money or whatever, like, and of course they're gonna say no, like I don't want it, but it's they have nobody else except for us, and and, and if we want the church to survive, we've got to learn how to like be there for them and to protect them and to help them out. This is our Christian responsibility. 
tithing is particularly for this purpose. If they don't eat, if they can't raise a family, we don't have a church. Right? It just doesn't work out like that. If all the priests are leaving the church to work, work like other jobs, then guess what? We don't have a church. That's what happens. So the congregation is like, like giving like to your priest is your Christian responsibility. You said, they're, they're taking what belongs to them. But are we like, not huh? supposed to give 10% regardless of whatever? That's your time, yeah. Is it 10%? Yeah, 10%. Do I have anything more? No. <laughs> no, not like that. Really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last point. And then he says, when you go somewhere else, find uh, somewhere, like, uh, search for a worthy person's house to live in uh, when you go somewhere. What that means is, like worthy person means somebody who accepts the gospel. Somebody who's like, you know, not going to give you a hard time when you're there, number one. Number two, it means somebody who, uh, like, when you go somewhere to serve, if you're in one particular house, uh, then others won't have to go, like, house to house to hunt you down. Like, if you're going, like, in this house today and another house tomorrow, whatever. The other thing, what it means is, if the disciples, every time they were traveling, they went to different houses, they would start, like, choosing. You know, like what's beneficial for them. Like this house, that one, wow, this is kind of big. The other one didn't have AC. This one does, and stuff like that. Everybody started thinking about the library the minute I said that. Yes. <laughs> but like, so we shouldn't be thinking about our fleshly desires. I know most of you guys don't, don't travel and, and understand what I'm saying, but just the, what I want you guys to take away from this is when we go into the world, just in general, please don't think about your fleshly desires. That's what we should get out of like this, uh, these verses, uh, like especially near the end. We're not there to 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 look at into our fleshly desires. We're there to look at our spiritual desires. Something I forgot to mention in the note, but it's okay. I'll mention it now. He also says later on at the end of the verse, like if they don't accept you, like wipe the dirt off your shoes and leave. That's what he talks about. Please understand, there's a difference between friendship and spiritual service, right? Like friendship. We're, we live in the world. Are we going to make friends that are not Christians? Right? We're going to interact with them. We're gonna, like, they're going to be our boss. They're going to be our co-workers. They're going to be our classmates. There's nothing that we, we can't just be like, you're not a Christian, get away from me. Like, we can't do that. Right? So we have to learn how to coexist with the rest of the world. When it comes to service, there's no exception. There's no, like, let me please this person. You know? Like, but no, like, what would they say? Like, you know, but ah, there's nothing. Service, service. Service, service. When we talk about the gospel, if that person is, is compromising on like the word of God, regardless of who they are, this is the teaching, this is what it is. There's no like in between. It says wipe the dust off of your shoes and leave. Meaning don't let that enter into your head. Don't let other people's false teachings enter your head because the more you entertain it, guess what happens? People start to compromise on it. Um, and then they say, like, that teaching, well, maybe, okay, like, perhaps, have you seen it from this direction? There's no such thing when it comes to the gospel. The gospel is very, very straightforward. It is this, we accept it, and this is the teaching. If they don't accept, what do we do? We wipe the dirt off our shoes of me, because this is service. There's a difference between friendship, and there's a difference between service. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's the reason why there weren't any female disciples of the so the so the uh, the apostles in the, in the book of Hebrews chapter I want to say seven um, he, he talks about priesthood is is like uh, playing the role of Christ for example like the apostles are are bishops which are basically priests but at a higher level so a priest especially for example like in liturgy uh, they're we're actually living they they're acting out the life of Christ. They're playing the role of Christ. Um, <clears throat> now, even in the world, like a Hollywood movie is made about Christ, they're going to choose a, a man to play the role of Christ and nothing else. Yeah. Um, so now these apostles are, are, are playing the role of Christ. So they're men in order to symbolize that, number one. Number two, they're also following the role of Adam, who was also a man and playing the role of a man. Um, 
there's actually a video we made about that, right? Why can't women start when they're when they're mm -hmm. their wives? Yeah. Like yeah, and if you see in there, priests, uh, female priest was not, a lot of people argue, for example, I don't know if you guys heard, it's a cultural thing. Like back in the day, of course, women couldn't be priests because they were looked down upon. You guys ever heard of that mm -hmm. argument? If you see, forget the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they had female priests. In the Old Testament. So it wasn't a culturally like a, like a forbidden or something for women to be priests. It's that Christ did not choose 12 women because they're playing the role of Christ. And they're playing the role of Adam, which is also a man. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we can keep going with this, but, um, you know, I'll stop.